pristine nature, hidden landscapes, enchanting wilderness, all in the middle of Europe. Welcome to the Balkan Express, a journey of discovery through five young nations in southeastern Europe. Rugged coastlines, majestic mountainscapes, and picturesque lakes, Montenegro is a breathtaking natural spectacle. A raft will take us along the second deepest canyon in the world. We'll visit a convent on an isolated island, and we'll meet the best seafarers in Montenegro. On the southeastern coast of the Adriatic, between Croatia and Albania, lies Montenegro. Its natural beauty is so impressive and unique that much of the country is a protected nature reserve and a World Heritage Site. Our first destination is Lake Skadar, known in the rest of the world as Lake Skutari. Two-thirds of Lake Scutari lies in Montenegro and the other third reaches into Albania. It is the largest lake on the Balkan Peninsula and is one of the most important swamp habitats and ornithological reserves on the European continent. In the western part, vast floodplains and waterscapes stretch forth. The estuaries of the rivers Chernojevic and Moracha. The lake itself is the 33rd largest in Europe. The strip of lowland forests, reeds and water lilies is home to more than 280 bird species. Ondrivizi knows them better than anybody else. He's the most prestigious ornithologist in Montenegro and has worked at Lake Scutari for over 30 years. Even in retirement, he is utterly dedicated to his life's project, protecting the rare Dalmatian pelican. This is the northernmost colony in the world. At Lake Skadar, the pelican population is very small. Our aim is to stabilize it and protect the species. In some years, the pelicans build no nests at all, so there's no offspring. The reason is often unfavorable weather, high water levels for long periods, and increasingly, people. In this regard, Lake Skada still needs more protection. It's not only man, but also nature, that makes it difficult for the shy and timid birds to find a nesting place here. The fluctuating water levels, from zero to five meters, makes the lake a unique natural phenomenon. According to season, it can double in size, completely altering its appearance. The vegetation flourishes so quickly and fiercely that the Dalmatian pelican can barely find a living space. To make sure the rare and endangered species doesn't disappear from the lake completely, André Vizi and his colleagues build islands that serve as places to nest. This is the most interesting colony on Lake Skadar. It's the first artificially established colony. And as you can see, it was built on a raft. These are the remains of the nests, of which there were 12, which has enriched the pelican population at Lake Skada with 17 young birds. Fifty different types of fish, 280 varieties of bird, 
and over 20 endemic species. Andre is a fierce protector of this natural landscape. He's been in charge of the conservation of this special lake for over 30 years and will never stop. Although people's disregard for the lake can bring him to despair, his faith in the force of nature remains. This is a beautiful lake, and somehow it's my life. As a biologist, I'm fascinated by the fast pace of the life cycle. Something comes anew, something else goes. It happens very quickly here. This pelican colony will be surrounded by reeds in just a few weeks and disappear. Nature conquers all. That's what gives me hope as a biologist and nature conservationist. Nature will survive anything, even us. Even traces of human history can be found amidst this great natural spectacle. On the island of Grimujur, Nicholas I, Montenegro's final king, imprisoned political prisoners, all of them non-swimmers. In the Middle Ages, many Orthodox churches and monasteries were built on the lake's islands. In those times, Lake Skadar was the center of the independent principality of Zita, the precursor of Montenegro. Twelve of these sacred buildings are still standing, and six of them are even inhabited. Ten years ago, nuns returned to this ancient convent on the island of Beshka. In the 15th century, the site was once the religious heart of the Zita Principality. Beshka Island lay in desolation for over 350 years, until Mother Superior Fortina brought it back to life. Together with another sister, she began to restore the old nunnery, which is now home to seven nuns and eight novices. Life here is hard. I always say three times as hard as anywhere else. For the first six years we had no electricity, but thank God we do now. Everything is more work. Everything needs to be brought here. That takes a lot of physical and spiritual strength. Just like the conservationist Andri Visi, the nuns of Beshka also care for and preserve the lake. They've turned the once barren island into their own Garden of Eden. Most of the sisters are academics. They worked as managers, professors or psychologists until a quest for answers and deeper meaning led them to the convent. Their life is hard and frugal. Serving God and doing chores. This is the daily routine at Beshka. Each nun has individual tasks in addition to her everyday chores and considers these her God-given duty and a personal challenge. Where did I learn to sew? Here, in the convent. I am still learning from an experienced sister. I had never sewed before. It was predestined for me by God. Although I thought I would be no good at it, it seems to be working very well. God's will is very important in life, particularly for us here at the convent. As in most Orthodox convents, icon painting is also a discipline the nuns carry out at Beshka. And although it's seen as a holy craft rather than an art form, distinct creative styles are evident. 
Some use glazing techniques, others tend towards the Greek style, and some to the Russian school. There are different styles and methods, but really, it's all Byzantine painting. My style is somewhere in the middle, with a touch of a Slavic soul. The convent only receives 200 euros a month from its local church. Money for their livelihood and the upkeep of the two churches under conservation has to be raised by the sisters themselves. They sell handmade devotional objects to tourists and pilgrims. After the demise of socialist Yugoslavia, the Orthodox cloisters are enjoying a revival and becoming more popular. Even the churches are filling up. Many Montenegrins consider the Orthodox religion to be an integral part of their national identity. Whilst this convent is being rebuilt, Montenegro is undergoing an important spiritual renewal. Many young sisters have come to us, and slowly it is being filled with religious life. From Lake Skadar, we travel along the Adriatic coastline to the north, to the Bay of Kotor. The four sea basins, encircled by majestic mountain chains, count as the most southern fjord in Europe. Although only 20 kilometers of land separate Lake Skadar from the sea, this strip is filled by a 1,600 meter high mountain range. The Montenegrin part of the Adriatic, between Croatia and Albania, is around 300 kilometers long. Ragged, deep coves and endless stretches of sand distinguish the Montenegrin coastline. The towns and cities are a stony testament to the turbulent history that the small country has endured. The most impressive part of the Montenegrin coastline is the Bay of Kotor, Boka Kotorska. The cove and the city of Kotor bear witness to a 2,000-year history. The Romans, the Byzantines, Venetians and the Habsburgs have all left their mark here. The region was the border as well as the link between the Orient and Occident, the Catholics and the Orthodox, the Christians and the Muslims. The Boka Kotorska also has a long history of seafarers, and shipbuilders. One of the most influential seafaring families were the Radimirs, Captain Vieko Radimir's ancestors. Despite its nautical reputation, there is no proper port in the cove, but instead a maritime academy and naval museum. The Maritime Museum documents the tradition of seafaring and tells the story of the Radimir family. It was one of the wealthiest families of the region and produced the most captains. I'm number 147, the 147th captain in our family. There will be more. At the moment, a few young men are learning at sea 
How many captains come from this cove, I don't know, but it's probably over a thousand. The Kotor Bay Navy, the fraternity of the seafarers, was once highly rated all over Europe for its outstanding fleet and accomplished captains. In the 18th century, more than 50 ships were crossing the oceans of the globe under its flag. This is what provided the wealth of the city, a fact still evident in its rich architecture. The island Sveti Georgia and Gospa Ojkripiela are the heart of the bay. The smaller one is man-made and an old pilgrimage site for the seafarers. Vieko Radimir documents and records the history of his family and the seafaring tradition. According to legend, two fishermen found an icon of the Holy Mary on a small rock in the middle of the cove. So they began to place stones around the rock and the island for the Holy Mother of God emerged. Island and church carry the name Maria of the Rock. She is the patron saint of the seamen and the small island a place of pilgrimage. Before departure, the crew would make a solemn promise to the Holy Mother of God, who was to protect them on the high seas and during bad weather. Whoever survived the storm brought an offering to the Holy Maria of the Rock as a thank you, which was usually a small silver plate. UNESCO has listed parts of the bay as a World Heritage Site, pulling in many tourists. An important source of income for the local people, but also an instigator of change. Many Montenegrins view these changes with a skeptical eye, as does Vieko Radimir, who likes reflecting on times gone by. There used to be hardly any change here. There was less traffic and that shaped people's lives here. Now it's so busy, lots of traffic, ships, tourists, newcomers. The demographic structure has changed. Everything looks different today. Nothing is how it used to be. Whilst Kotor Bay has become a tourist magnet, its rivers and mountainous hinterland are seldom visited. From the bay, we travel along the vast mountains to the historic heart of the country, Cetinje, the city of kings and painters. Just behind a cove lies the landmark of Montenegro, Mount Lofchen. On its summit lies the resting place of Petar II, Petrovich Njegos, Montenegro's archbishop at the start of the 19th century. He was reformer and innovator of the country and also its most famous poet and thinker. The historic city of Cetinje lies at the foot of the Lofchen Massif, once home to the archbishops of Montenegro. Today, the picturesque city is of no political importance, although this is still the site of the president's official residence. It remains the undisputed cultural center of Montenegro. A vast array of museums, statues, and historic sites adorn the small city. Cetinje was founded in 1482, when an Orthodox convent was built here. At the time, it lay on the border to the expanding Ottoman Empire, endured many battles, and was often destroyed and rebuilt.
The Tsetinia convent has been the political and spiritual heart of Montenegro since the 18th century. The bishops of the city have long been the rulers of the country. The convent shelters important Christian relics, the right hand of John the Baptist and a splinter from the Holy Cross. The sacred objects reach Montenegro on meandering journeys via Jerusalem, Malta, St. Petersburg and Berlin at the end of the 18th century. Cetinje is also the city of painters and it boasts the highest population of artists in the world per inhabitant. One of the most interesting is the art professor Mikhailo Jovicevic. The history of the city and the lyrical philosophical works of the great archbishop Petar Petrovich Njegos are his inspiration. Almost all of the artists in Montenegro come from the historically rich Cetinje, just like Jovicevic. He succeeds in depicting the religious mysticism of the city like no other. We were all shaped by an aesthetic that is quite unknown to the rest of Europe. It's based on ancient Montenegro. Moral concepts like glory and heroism are mirrored in our works. Since his youth, Mikhailo Jovicevic's artwork has dealt with one topic alone, the Bible. His works are abstract depictions of religious themes. He's been professor at numerous faculties over the last 50 years, yet he's barely known outside Cetinje. Back in socialist Yugoslavia, religious art was frowned upon. My themes were not in line with the contemporary ideology. I understand that. But nobody ever forbade me to draw anything. They just ignored me. It's better for an artist to be forbidden than to be ignored. Mikhailo Jovicevic is obsessed with artwork and more than 10,000 works are stored in his attic studio. Montenegro's independence has changed little for the artist. The government may gift his works to high-ranking visiting heads of state, but his work is not exhibited. He's gotten used to not being taken seriously and has a simple explanation for it. This environment has real advantages in that nobody bothers you here. If Pablo Picasso had worked here where I work, no one would have ever heard of him, just as no one's heard of me. Our journey takes us further north, deep into the mountains of the Dormitor National Park. The picturesque mountainous landscape is a display of untouched nature with clear glacial lakes and deep ravines. Rugged peaks, wild primeval forests, and picturesque meadows. Only a few people live in the north of Montenegro. Its nature is pristine. The Dormitor Massif is the highest in Montenegro. It is a part of the Dinaric Alps that run along the Adriatic coastline. This unique landscape 
has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site for 35 years and falls under special protection. It is the country's largest national park and a region of organic agricultural importance. Wind and water have forged deep gorges into the impressive landscape, like the Tara, the longest and most spectacular river in Montenegro. As a result of the cleanliness of the water, the river is also known as the teardrop of Europe. The Tara is home to a rare and almost forgotten craft, raft building. The logs are between 8 and 10 meters in length and weigh a few hundred kilos each. Ten of them are needed to build a good raft. Goran Lekovic is the only person in the Tara River Gorge who is a true master of the art. He builds his rafts as they were built a hundred years ago. In those days, they transported wood along the Tara, over the Danube and to the Black Sea. It's not easy work. You're wet, sweaty, but the love for this river and an old tradition that can probably only be found here lets you forget all these difficulties. So that the raft lies on the water correctly, Goran ensures the logs are carefully arranged according to their individual qualities. Each piece behaves differently in the water and under pressure. The logs are bound with metal rope and wooden pegs, and every staple has to be correctly placed. I learned the technique of raft building from two true raft building legends, the real ones who transported wood over the Tara and knew every last rock of this place. They were from Bosnia, they taught me. I remained here as a pupil. Now their sons are coming here, they build rafts too, and we're friends, like back in the good old days. The most important thing is that the Tara flows and rafts can still be seen on it. Goran no longer transports wood with the raft, but in its place, tourists from all over the world. The Tara River Gorge is one of the most inaccessible and wild waterways in Europe. A raft ride on it is an unforgettable experience. Parts of the banks along the river are so wild, it's unlikely that man has ever stepped foot on them. The rock face rises up to 1,500 meters. It's only in the Grand Canyon that higher gorges can be found. The Tara Gorge is the second deepest ravine on the planet. The Tara means everything to us. I've succeeded, perhaps as the only one in Montenegro, in convincing the young people in the village to not be desperate to move to the city. I've managed to keep about 30 people here and have trained them. All work on the Tara so that our future is secure here. I'd like it if this were possible in other villages in Montenegro and beyond. Gora knows almost every pebble in his river and all the stories of the Tara Gorge, like the one about the shortest and most charming river in Europe, Lyotika. 5,000 cubic meters of fresh spring water per second rush out of the rocks. It may be the cleanest water you will ever drink. Gushing waterfalls, rushing rivers, trickling streams, the Dormitur.
The name probably comes from the Celtic and means mountain full of water. Craggy summits carved by glaciers and karst formations mold the high mountains of the Dormitor. Almost 50 peaks tower over 2,000 meters above sea level. This is Zoran Vojinovic's second home. He is in charge of the local mountain rescue service that looks after the hiking trails and climbing routes. We mountain climbers always say, the more beautiful it is, the more dangerous it is. We like it, that this is how a dormitor is. There's a summit in the Dormitor Massif which 10 to 12-year-olds can climb. It's not all that dangerous. Since early childhood, Giorgitsa has been joining her father on his tours. The 20-year-old is already a mountain guide herself, but still takes her father's advice very seriously. The mountain rescue team is also responsible for marking the hiking trails. Routes in the Dormitor Mountains have been marked since 1938, and today no trail remains unmapped. Every year, we walk all the trails and check the signs and markings. We renew the ones that were damaged in winter. We're responsible for more than 200 kilometers of trails, which are all marked and accessible. There's a lot to look after. They may know every rock, but the Dormitor Mountains still fascinate Georgica and Zoran. Georgica studies in the capital Pogorica, but rather than go on holiday to the coast with her friends, she comes home to the Dormitor. The Dormitor is everything to me. Ever since we were young, our parents took us here on any free day for every trip. Now, in the summer, the mountains give me the chance to earn money for my studies. And it really is my purpose in life. There's no TV, no internet, no mobile phones. It's paradise, complete peace. You can hear the birds singing, there's no noise, no shouting. That gives us strength, which we draw from. Calm, quiet, serenity. For me, that's the Dormitor. Extreme sports lovers are also drawn to the Dormitor. Those who have had enough of bungee jumping or rafting can try canyoning. Zoran's young colleagues are preparing a group for a tour. It's a dangerous undertaking that should only be done with professionals. Zoran wants to make sure everything goes smoothly. Canyoning, hiking in usually inaccessible ravines. Kitted out in a wetsuit and helmet, you venture into the Nevidio Canyon, three and a half kilometers through six degree water, 25 jumps from five meters high, and corridors so tight, your hips graze along the canyon walls. Some don't quite realize what they've let themselves in for.
This really is an adrenaline sport. In some parts, getting through the canyon is so challenging and exhausting, it can be seen as survival training. The Dormitor and the Tara Gorge. The countryside offers everything. Peaceful lakes, wild rivers, and dangerous gorges. An unforgettable natural adventure. To the east of the Dormitor lies our final destination, the Biogradska Gora National Park. It's known for its primeval forest and unique cheese. We're taking the Balkan Express upstream along the Tara and through the meandering hills of the Bielasitska Mountains. The Biogradska Gora is the smallest of the five national parks in Montenegro, but is second to none with its diversity of plant and animal life. More than 2,000 different plant species bloom here, most of them known in the Northern Hemisphere, and several more. The heart of the national park is its primeval forest, known by the same name. It's one of the last three primeval forests in Europe, and was put under protection in 1878. Ever since, nature has been left to its own devices to take its wild course. On the edge of the national park, amidst the foothills of the Bielasitska mountains, lies the village Lipovo. Milianka Puletic milks her cows twice a day. She and her husband Mishko live in Lipovo. They're self-sufficient, like almost all the people who live here. It's autumn and there's much to do on the farm. Here, small family farms are traditionally run. They're subsistence farmers. If they're lucky, something is left over and can be sold. We've gathered about 10 tonnes of hay. We need that for about 10 cows. We also have seven and eight calves that we sell or slaughter. We still need to make 15 to 20 tonnes of hay. The Pulitichs have 10 cows and 20 goats. All the animals are raised well, and all their food is natural with no additives. Everything produced is of the highest organic standards. In 1991, Montenegro declared itself an organic nation and supports small farmers in their efforts at sustainable farming as much as possible. Every day, Milianka makes up to 15 kilos of cheese and the region's speciality, flaky cheese. It is made differently from other cheeses because you leave the milk to settle overnight. The next morning, you add fresh milk and some lactic acid bacteria. And she leaves it to thicken for a day under a heavy weight. This is cheese from yesterday. It's done, and I'm getting it ready for the tasting. I'm making a rolled cheese out of it with cream.
i kvalitetan je, a onda je zato što se na te listiće pravi. This is a high quality cheese and very popular. Mnogo različitih. Because one can use it in many different ways and make a lot of delicacies from it. Na mnogo načina različitih degustacija. A tough life in a picturesque setting. More and more people are leaving the villages and giving up their farms. The government and international funds are trying to support traditional agriculture and give the farmers new opportunities. Milianka has received this financial support, which she used to build a guest hut. In the small space, she welcomes those who are keen to learn about the rural local life and the making of traditional Montenegrin delicacies. My main motivation is to show my family, especially my grandchildren, that the work on the field, in the barn and in the house, that it gives us joy when guests come from afar and are delighted by the nature and by our work on the farm. We don't see it ourselves. We don't realize how beautiful life actually is here. Montenegro, the land of the Black Mountains, an undiscovered jewel in the heart of Europe. <laughs>